they weren't up to You get close. I'm down. Hey, you've tuned in to Cisco Unplugged. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cisco Unplugged. I'm Dan Klammer, leader of the Wireless Center of Excellence here at Cisco. And this week on episode 11, we're going to be discussing high density wireless. And I'd like to welcome back to the show a couple familiar faces here. We have Al Dundai joining us from Richardson, Texas. He has uh, been on episode uh, 10, last episode where he did some nice interviews on the knock of Cisco Live. I highly recommend if you missed that episode to go back and check it out on our YouTube channel. And uh, also, he did a deep dive on 6 gigahertz in episode three. Hey, Al, how are you? Good. How, how are you, Dan? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. Good. And then thanks also, we thanks. Yeah, we have Scott Clayton from Richmond, Virginia, and he's also been on the last episode as well and sharing his experiences with us at Cisco Live. Hey, Scott, thanks for joining us. How are you? Morning, Dan. Yep. The interloper from Cisco Live is back again. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Glad, glad you both made it back. <laughs> so before we get started here real quick, I just would like to uh, have a couple of reminders here. If you have any questions and you've joined us live here on the episode, you can join us in the Slido question and answer panel, or you sub can, can submit your questions in the Slido Q&A panel. If you're in the WebEx, that's on the right-hand side of your WebEx pane. If you're joining us via YouTube, you'll see that link below the uh, video link in the YouTube uh, page. So you can click there and submit your questions live. We have TSA's uh, Technical Solutions Architects here from Cisco standing by to answer those questions. We can either answer them online. And also, if there's some time during the WebEx here, or I'm sure, I should say during the broadcast today, we can uh, answer those live as well. So as usual, this is being recorded and will be available later on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash at get unplugged. So you can register, or I should say, you can check out previous episodes there and also click subscribe there and you'll be notified when we do go live. You also can register for upcoming episodes if you'd like to be notified and get those on your calendar at our link, which is cs.co slash get unplugged. You'll see a list of the full upcoming episodes. We've got some other great episodes coming here and uh, check those out as well. All right, that's it for the reminders. So with that, let's get on with the show. Al, take it away. All right. Thanks, Dan. So when Scott and I first started looking at this session, one of the first things we wanted to do was define what is high density, because there's it's probably a, a, a term that's often used, but probably not well defined. So the first thing we did is we said, let's find an innocent third party to help us with this. And, and just to be clear, if you look at the bottom, uh, it, this is not the Al, this is not my own personal chat bot, right? right? This is not Al. There, there's a fundamental difference between Al and AI and that is the word intelligence. So as we go through this, understand this is coming from Google Bard as a, as a uh, AI chatbot. <clears throat> All right, so what a couple of key things that we use to define this, right? One is it's a lot of users or a lot of devices in a small space. Um, and then typically 30 or more clients connecting to an AP, uh, and I thought this is actually a pretty good that 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 the the uh, Google Bard came up with a pretty good explanation for this. And then examples of this are things like sports stadiums, airports, concert halls, so on and so forth. So one of the differences, though, is they're all high density, but they're not all the same size. So as part of high density, we have to understand how does this scale out in terms of size? So what I would design necessarily for, uh, the, the same principles apply for say, like a small classroom that maybe has high density as would be like a large stadium, but I may have to set up different scaling parameters. So let's take a look at that. Let's jump in. Let's start by looking at the wired side first. So we'll look at the, the wired infrastructure side and talk a little bit about what do we need to scale out from a wired side. Um, first of all, we have to think about where do we have these layer two and layer three boundaries, right? And, and that can come back into how we do our wireless. So the, wireless, the wired and the wireless both have these layer two and layer three boundaries. They don't have to be in the same locations. But for example, let's say I had a, a conference center 
Uh, and I had uh, a layer a layer three boundary right at the edge of the conference center. That means everybody that's coming and going from that conference center now has to do a layer three roam, right? Uh, and depending on how that works, you, of course, you have to design where you keep the same gateway across that, that boundary. Uh, that can be a lot of additional burden on the wireless network. So we want to make sure as we're designing these boundaries from the on the wired infrastructure side that we're accommodating that from a wireless standpoint and from how the users use it. And then, of course, one of the things that often gets missed is PoE, right? So we a lot of times we'll look at the data sheet and say, yeah, that switch can do you know PoE plus or UPoE, so I'm good. Remember, there's a budget for PoE on those switches, and you may need more than one power supply, depending on how you're stacking things. And so you want to make sure you look at that holistically in terms of the number, especially in a high density situation where the number of APs you may plug into that switch may be more than you, you would normally do. And then let's one other thing on this uh, page that we we'll probably jump into a little more details the cam table requirements on a switch. So um, if that switch is, the, is the, um, the gateway for the wireless network, it needs to be able to manage all of the MAC addresses on that network. So if I have something, let's say I have a 9300 switch, that'll take up to 32,000 MAC addresses. That may be enough for some venues, right? So if I'm doing a, a few lecture halls or something like that, that may be fine for my gateway. However, Maybe I have other things on it, or maybe this is a large venue, or maybe this is a you know a, a, a sixty thousand seat stadium or something like that, where it's you know I have a lot of clients in a very small area. That will no longer work, right? So I have to look at other devices. For example, a ninety five hundred can go anywhere from sixty four thousand up to two hundred fifty six thousand MAC addresses. So we want to make sure that whatever we use for that gateway, that we're capable of supporting the CAM table requirements on a wired standpoint. <clears throat> And of course, hey, output is always important. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, before we move yeah. off of this uh, slide, um, are, is this meant to be an exhaustive list of everything we need to be looking at? No. Wired? Yeah, no, we're even skipping over some things that are on this list just because of time. And, we're, and, and that's a good point, Scott. I mean, just we should probably make sure everybody understands. We're going to try to touch on what we think are the most important elements of, of this, there's no way we can get it in, in you know, in a 30 minute time slot, we can do a thorough job on, on high density design. So ah, great point. So this is not a complete list. This is just, uh, this is what we think are kind of the, the highlights that we want to look for. Probably, so, I mean, I, I've done stadiums, I've done, you know, large conference centers and, and that sort of stuff in the past. These are things in, in my mind that sort of bubble up as being the critical elements as we're looking at the design side. So, Perfect. All right. And then throughput, obviously, I mean, there's nothing like designing a great wireless network and then putting it through a bottleneck on the back end. And I've seen that many times. Right. And so we just need to make sure that we're we are communicating all the way through out to the Internet providers or wherever we want to connect to uh, that we've got adequate throughput. And then finally, there's always a decision is where do I put my IP helper? Do I put it on my gate on 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 my uh, controller? Do I put it on the first top gateway? The, 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 the recommendation has always been to put it on the first top gateway. Uh, especially in these high density environments, just because that offloads everything from the controller. Controller does other things, right? So that puts more the the, the owners uh, on the on the switch itself. Okay, all right. So go ahead to the next slide. Now, as we look at scaling, right? We said, you know, you may have a small venue that may be high density, but you may also have a large density that, uh, sorry, large venue that may have high density. So things that we have to look at it, like number of concurrent subscribers. I can only get so many uh, uh, devices, for example, in a wireless line controller. I can, only get, I can only authenticate so many devices in a particular uh, AAA node, for example, or like ICE, for example. So I have to be careful about the number, just the total numbers of subscribers. And, and remember that there's some memory in this, in that if a subscriber disconnects, he's not always immediately gone from the network. So there, you want to make sure you plan for about 20, 25% additional subscribers in there. Um, in addition with that, there's there's how many are in a 24-hour period, because there's often, often licensing requirements around numbers in a 24-hour period, or even tables that flush periodically, but maybe within 24, 24 hours, or sometimes it's eight hours. But understand these kind of mechanisms in your network. And then a big one is authentication rates. And this is one I see that's missed often, right? Uh, it, there is a rate of authentication on any AAA server that you're using, or any authentication mechanism that you're using. So if you're using WebAuth, or you're using uh, um, uh, .1x, or you know, any of those require you to go back and look at 
what is the the, the authentication rates of that? For example, uh, AAA uh, like ICE, for example, on one of the policy nodes, uh, if you're doing .dot one X, will do about 150 authentications per second. If you're doing MAP, will do about 400 authentications per second. So I, we, we just need to be careful that we're we're designing this holistically as we look at that. And the same same principle applies with DHCP, right? Especially if you're doing things like web auth, right? Web auth, you, the client's going to pull an IP address before they authenticate. Uh, same thing with an open. If you're if somebody's running an open SSID, they're going to pull an IP address before they authenticate. You can pull a lot of uh, IP addresses. Uh, as if you're like, again, we'll take the example of a conference center where you may have people walking past that conference center all day long. Guess what? If you have a 24-hour lease on that DHCP, they're constantly pulling IP addresses all day long. You can very quickly run into an exhaustion issue on that network, right? And then uh, just, uh, there, and there's, again, we don't have time to go into the details on these timers and stuff like that. I'd love to do that. But uh, one other, just a quick mention is pay attention to the WNCD processes, right? These are like little mini uh, controllers within the controllers. Uh, when we did Cisco Live, for example, that was one of the things that was up on the board in the NOC is watching these CPU processes within these WNCD uh, uh, daemons, right? So we need to be very careful about not overloading one daemon or another, okay? And now before we move off this slide, yeah. one quick question I have for you is that certainly yeah. some of these high density venues are not 24 by seven locations, whether it be large lecture style classrooms or even you know uh, conference centers and or uh, sports stadiums. Should we be looking at uh, you know, average values for those time frames, or how, how do we want to design this when we're looking at kind of these some of these numbers we have out there? Yeah, in some cases it's as average, in some cases it's peak, right? So uh, like concurrent subscribers often is the peak, right? Uh, DCP would be that you know more of the peak. In some cases, it may be more of an average, right? So uh, it really depends. You have to look at that on 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 a per uh, metric basis. So yeah, All right, thank you. Yeah, no, good question. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so now let's talk. Let's let's switch gears a little bit to talk about RF design principles. So three things to watch. I mean, in general. RF is pretty simple, right? Um, and we have three things we need to watch, right? One is the AP downlink. And this is the thing that most everybody's aware of. And everybody, you know, looks at the signal strength on their phone, or you you, you look at the downlink signal strength off your um, uh, uh, your, your plots from your, your wireless site surveys. Sometimes we forget about client uplink, right? So we need to make sure we understand what's that relationship between the AP downlink and the client uplinks. And then the one that's often, when you get into high density, this is probably one of the most critical and often kind of forgotten about, and that is the AP neighborship. So the, the, what happens is if I turn, for example, let me go back to years and years ago when we only had 2.4 gigahertz. First stadium we did, we turned up 2.4 gigahertz and guess what? The, the airtime was 100% utilized and nobody was on the network yet. Why is that? Because all the APs in that, in that venue could hear each other and so all of the, the 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 broadcasts that were being broadcast from these APs used up all the airtime. Now, so there's some things we can do to help with those broadcasts. For example, that second bullet down there, we can you know we can increase the basic rates, which means the broadcasts go off faster. We can we want to decrease the SSID counts. Um, and of course, the big thing is we've gotten more spectrum now with five gigahertz, so that makes it a lot more viable. So we don't have. Uh, as much of an issue, but the capacity has also gone up and these, the demand for capacity has gone up. And so it's very important as we're looking at this, that we minimize that uh, AP to AP. So what can we do to do that? So directional antennas, directional antenna is going to be those key values that we add into this design. And we're going to talk about how that works in just a second. Um, the other thing that can be important is RxSOP. So for, for fellow old guys on the call, um, the, the, um, if you think of the old CB radios, right, we had a squelch knob on that. And so basically you'd hear the kind of the, the, the background noise kind of, and then you'd turn the squelch knob up and it would mute out the background noise. What you're really doing is changing the sensitivity effectively on that radio. So you don't have to listen to all this kind of weak signals. And then when you're ready to talk, you would just talk over those weak signals. Well, that's exactly the way SOP works on an AP effectively we set the threshold so that we're ignoring all of the other signals coming into it because Wi-Fi is very, very polite, right? It won't talk over anything else. And so we're basically saying, hey, ignore this, turn your squelch up, ignore this, and just continue to talk over this other traffic uh, in the network so that 
we can do things like get the beacons out because remember the beacons are contention driven, right? Um, and then, um, so the other things like use of 11K and 11V are good. They contain a lot of good information that help client make, clients make good decisions. We do have to be a little bit careful. It's, it's something you want to look at in your particular venue. You, you might try with or without just because they do take, if you have a large venue with a lot of, you know, client uh, interaction between the, the various APs, um, you might see some loading based on that airtime loading. You might see some higher CPU. Again, this is back to that WNCD process. Processes. Um, 11R, if you're doing anything that involves authentication, is absolutely paramount, right? So we definitely want to keep that on in these high density venues. If you're doing open roaming, I'm sorry, sorry, if you're doing open, not open roaming, open roaming definitely is that one X, right? It requires this is very helpful for open roaming. But if you're doing an open authentication or web uh, or web auth or something like that, then this is not as, as, as effective. Okay. All right. So let's jump into a little bit about antenna theory. So remember we talked about, we wanna see the AP downlink, the client uplink and the, and the AP neighbors. What can we do about that? So first of all, the green antenna is a directional, the green pattern rather is a directional pattern. And the, and the orange pattern is kind of an omnidirectional pattern. So we can see if I'm in the, the coverage area of the AP itself, it's helping me with my wanted signal, right? So my wanted signal is going up, my green, the, the gain is higher. Uh, in that area where I'm, I'm sitting at, or I'm, I'm, I'm moving at right now, and then as I move away, the gain diminishes. Now that's going to help me in other areas, right? But even more importantly, if you look at the the 90 and the 270s, right, I have kind of a notch, which means other APs on that same plane are going to lose signal from this AP or going to get their signal reduced from this AP, which means less interference between the APs. So it's really kind of helping me with three things. So let's dive into that. Now we're going to look at that more in a linear picture, right? So this is a linear picture. So I've taken that same, and these are, by the way, these are just equations. They're not actual patterns. I just mapped out some equations here to, to get me simulated patterns. Um, and, and if you look at the uh, the green line, right, on the on the left, that is the, the higher gain antenna signal strength at that particular location. So right underneath the AP, I have a very high signal strength from my wanted signal, right? If I were, the blue line represents what would happen if I were to do an Omni, right? So you can see I have a higher than an Omni. So I've, I've helped myself in terms of signal to noise plus interference ratio, right? All right, so now let's move, let's pretend like we're gonna walk across uh, to the other AP. So now we're, we're roaming effectively over to the other AP. Now I get some additional help. Once again, I get the additional signal strength from the, the higher gain antenna, which now my client, often clients make decisions on roaming based on the RSSI they receive. My RSSI is better now because I have a directional antenna. Also, the interference from the other antenna, the green line you can see is below what would have happened if I would have used an Omni. So now I've got, not only have I reduced my interference, I've, I've caused that signal I was on to decay previously. So that again is gonna help me in terms of making those roaming decisions in, in sticky clients. So really I'm getting help here in terms of improving my wanted signal, signal to noise ratio or signal to interference, interference plus noise ratio. I'm, I'm improving my, uh, my, my roaming parameters uh, and I'm reducing my, my overall noise in the environment by putting the, the energy where I want it and I'm getting less AP to AP coupling, all right? So that's why we, when we think of, uh, of directional or think of uh, um, high density, we almost always think of using directional antennas for that. All right. All right. Go ahead into the next. All right. So, um, and I think this first bullet is probably one of the most important um, comments in this entire presentation. You can't, op you cannot optimize for poor RF design right? Uh, there, there's no compensation. There's no amount of optimization you can do to fix a poor design. Uh, and, and let, let me just restate that in another way. If you don't do your design correctly, all the AI in the world is not going to help. All the owl in the world is not going to help, right? You have to get that design correct up front. 
then optimization can do its job. Um, the challenge is, is, like we talked about before, it's that AP to AP coupling and, and, and reducing the interference into other cells, into you know, the other clients here from my AP, for example. So reducing that interference level becomes very important. So it's more about what the APs do not hear rather than what they do hear. And in the, in the, in the legacy bands and 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, we're still using 20 megahertz most often, right? Because at this point, our clients still don't have the ability to do, do OFDMA. OFDMA is basically technology that allows us to sort of chop up uh, the signal in a, given, in a given amount of spectrum so that we can serve multiple clients at the same time. Um, at six gigahertz, that's not the case anymore, right? So at six gigahertz, we're going to start off with using things like 80 megahertz bandwidth. And we, we don't have time to get into all the six gigahertz goodies today, but uh, we've had some previous sessions, a number of good sessions on six gigahertz you can go back and look at, and, and you'll understand kind of why we're picking things like 80 megahertz. But because we can service multiple clients in a single slot, we can use 80 megahertz now with six gigahertz. So, so six gigahertz with the additional, you know, the 1200 megahertz of spectrum, right? Almost three times what we had previously uh, is going to make a big difference in these, uh, these venues. And Scott's going to go into some, some new advancements uh, in terms of products in that area shortly. So, um, and then of course, one of the things we want to do just from an optimization standpoint is we want to look for uneven distribution of clients across APs. And then we can do a bit of tuning where we maybe adjust the power levels on these, those APs down a little bit to move clients off to other. We, we, we don't want to use things like band select and load balancing. If we can help it, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're, they're forcing things. If we can do it natively by adjusting power levels, it's much better. And just Scott's going to, again, go into more details around the 9104 in just a second, but a couple of things just from a practical standpoint, from an implementation standpoint, Portrait or landscape, it's important when you deploy those that you know which one you're deploying it in and that your your installers in, in, install them correctly, right? It's not forgiving because now we have these are programmable antennas or they're, they're, they're uh, programmable arrays, right? So we can split the beam and you'll see that more in a second. Um, and, and then... Um, the other thing is we're probably going to be forced to do manual uh, RRM for this because remember that side load we talked about in that in that antenna pattern is so low with these. So the AP to AP coupling is so low in this that they just don't hear each other, which is great from an interference standpoint, but kind of breaks the way RRM works. So we generally just set a manual plan for these. So, all right. And so Scott's going to go into more details around the, the products and in kind of what their capabilities are and how we apply those products in into this environment. So Scott, go take it away. Thanks, Al. Appreciate that. So one of the beauties here is Al kind of broke this out and gave us a lot of the, the why of, of why we want to do certain things. Now we're going to get into how do we make all this stuff happen? And, and then, you know, kind of put, put kind of the, 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 you know, um, the, the ideas behind kind of what we want to do here. So first things first, you know, it's kind of, I went through, obviously we, we now know that directional antennas are absolutely the way to go when you're looking at different things. Well, that's part of the battle, right? So we now know that uh, we want to do a directional antenna. How do we choose what's directional antenna we want to use? So there's a couple of different things we want to kind of look at. Obviously um, the density of the clients to be served, our availability of the mounting assets, where are we going to be able to put these antennas? You know, a lot of that's dictated oftentimes by, uh, the wall type we're using, where on the ceiling it's going to be mounted, um, things along those lines as well. So we need to take, take into account all that, as well as the antenna placement, like I said earlier. So, you know, things like line of sight, uh, isolation from ambient RF, those are the kind of things we're going to want to take a look at and make sure we know exactly where we're going to be placing this before we choose what our antenna we're going, to, we're going to go with. Here's a quick snapshot of kind of the more popular antennas that we typically see excuse me, seeing these kind of high density uh, type environments. Obviously the first one, the CAT 9103, or the, I'm uh, sorry, the antenna 9103. This is part of our new product line of access points. This is really what we call a narrow band eight by eight patch antenna. It's really designed to work with a 9130 uh, access point that has an eight by eight, five gigahertz uh, antenna or radio built into it. So it allows us to really take a full advantage of all the capabilities of that 9130 access point with an antenna that's, that is uniquely designed for that particular access point itself. Below that, we have the 2566P4RW. This is a hugely uh, popular uh, antenna. I think if you go to most conference centers throughout the world, you'll most likely, or airports, you'll most likely see this antenna uh, kind of hanging on the wall in a lot of places. It is very high, heavily utilized. It has more of a wider uh, array, as you can kind of see from a beam width standpoint, as opposed to that kind of that 70, 75 degree uh, beam width. This has more of like 105 to 125 uh, degree beam with. So it's really designed to kind of pick up 
um, you point that direction really down towards the floor, the areas covering, but have more of a wider uh, wider pickup of, of clients in that area. We also have the 2566 D4M uh, listed below that, very similar to the one above it. It's just a little bit more narrow uh, as far as this goes. So for specific use cases, we have a narrower uh, audience you're trying to pick up or pick up clients in a, in a much more smaller space. Um, this is a great fit for that. And then finally below the 9104, I'm going to spend more time on the details here in just a few minutes. Uh, this is really our stadium-based antenna. It is state-of-the-art antenna. It's kind of the, the latest version of what we've been doing with stadium antennas. And I'm going to go into some of the uniqueness of this particular antenna, just so everyone's aware of kind of what, what it is. But it is really, really utilized well for uh, large uh, stadium concert hall, uh, you know, basketball arenas, um, things like that. We use these very, very often in, in those kind of settings. And, and Scott, and you mentioned this a little bit, but just on those first three antennas on that list, it's real common to have those up in the ceiling pointing straight down, right? So we create little cells. This may be like in a walkway leading up to a, a large venue or something like that. Uh, that's a real com- If you go to um, uh, convention centers, for example, the smaller convention rooms have those kind of antennas in them uh, pointing straight down from the ceiling. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So just kind of creating that those uh those unique bubbles uh below for for those uh for clients that are uh underneath it um yeah great point out thank you uh and as far as the meraki side of things if you do have a location that have meraki antennas uh meraki aps we do have external antennas here's just a quick subset uh, of those so that we can show kind of the, the availability uh that's there with with uh, the meraki aps themselves a little bit more on the 9104, like I said earlier, and Alice mentioned too, this was really designed for those large stadium public venue type type events. It is a dual five by a dual five gigahertz, four by four arrays uh, built into it. It has some uh, software defined anomalies or not, not, excuse me, not anomalies, software defined uh, characteristics that we'll go into here in a second that make this a, uh, a state of the art, unique access point on the market. A couple of things to kind of keep in mind when we're looking at the 9104, it is designed to cover clients that are longer distance away, right? A lot of times we would think about, um, you know, typically that, that 50 to 70 foot range is generally what we're looking at for most of our antennas. These are designed to go over, you know, 100 feet and maybe in some cases a little bit more than that. Uh, so we can have these eight antennas mounted up in catwalks and uh, stadium roofing overhead kind of kind of ideas is the behind or the idea behind these particular uh, antennas. These are all outdoor rated uh, as well. And that's important to know too, as you're looking at uh, kind of open air type in environments, we may need to do that. Uh, the antenna and the AP are all in one. Uh, so no enclosures required uh, for those kind of things. And as Al mentioned earlier, these are very tight RF patterns. So we need to think about that as we're kind of, if we're designing for that, um, you know, that, that cell to cell or uh, having the capabilities to kind of hear each other from a, from other APs is going to be a little bit different than you're typically used to in a typical indoor environment. So what makes this 9104 unique is this software configurable beam idea. As you can kind of see here, there's there's really two different kind of versions that you can kind of go through when you're looking at, at the 9104. One is what we call a wide beam uh, functionality. And this is a, uh, each each uh, array inside the 9104 can be configured for, for this. So if you have clients that are going to be a little bit closer to the access point, uh, maybe you might want to go with a wide beam to pick up a larger larger swath of those clients. Or if you have a situation where this access point, this antenna are going to be mounted a little bit further away from the clients, we may want to go with a narrow beam. Or if we want to pick up a smaller subset of the arena or location that we're using, we may want to go with the narrow beam uh, functionality for this. So you can kind of see it trims it down from an 80 megahertz, or 80 degree uh, beam width down to about a 25 degree beam width. So it really kind of focuses that energy. And as a result, we get a little bit further um, you know, further down uh, distance that the, that antenna um, pattern can go. And then the other thing that's really unique with this 9104 is it has this beam steering capability. So we can literally offset the um, the beam width that is being sent from the 9104 by either 10 or 20 degrees. So you can kind of see in this picture how we can take the a single access point and use each array to kind of cover two different areas of, of the, the arena or the location that we're trying to, to cover. So very, very unique in this. Uh, we don't have to tilt the antenna to do that. It uses um, the capabilities inside the 9104 to kind of point the direction of the, the antenna pattern, uh, either 10 or 20 degrees offset from where the antenna is. So, so let's show you a quick example. So, I'm sorry, so I'll about this. Real quick, Scott. So there's there's yeah. th- there's three slots then, right? So there's a two four, which is a, a, a kind of a, a wider yep. band. And then there's two other slots that you can use for your two five gigahertz signals. And, and those are all independent, right? So you can configure those wide beam, narrow beam. And you can configure them as an offset all independently. Is that correct? 
That is exactly right. And that's, okay. that's about what I'm about to show here. And then great point. So the one thing to mention here, the 2.4 gigahertz, is, as Al mentioned, that's going to be considered slot zero in this scenario. That's always going to be wide beam. That's not configurable. We're going to use uh, wide beam for the 2.4, but each of the five gigahertz slot can be set independently. And here's a great example in this picture showing you. So here's a, a typical kind of soccer stadium uh, that has an overhang, you know, to keep the, um, keep the visitors and the, the spectators dry if there are, um, you know, rain events or weather events kind of thing. And in this case, we may want to hang these APs and antennas up in the uh, that overhang area. And you kind of see AP1 here is, is uh, the, fir the first one we get to. It's a little bit closer to those spectators that are in the top of the stadium. In that particular case, we may want to go with the wide uh, array for that one so that we're actually um, picking up the clients that are a little bit closer to us and we don't have to, we don't really need that longer shot to be able to get to to those particular clients. But on slot two, you can notice that we might want to use the narrow beam uh, on, on that one. And we may want to offset that 20 degrees to pick up those spectators that are in level two of this, this arena. Uh, so we can use that same access point to pick up uh, different clients up in the top and then in that second section. And then on AP2, you can notice we're actually using the narrow beam on both slot one and slot two, and we're offsetting it by 20 degrees, which allows us to pick up clients on the that second level again with slot one and pick up uh, clients that are down the, the, the uh, front row uh, of this arena stadium with, uh, with that slot two access point. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in being able to handle uh, different kind of design scenarios with it. So really cool antenna uh, that has some excellent technology and it that allows us to do different neat, cool things with outdoor uh, deployments. And as Al mentioned earlier, uh, when we were walking through, here's this typical kind of conference center type design that we'll see. We see these a lot with airports uh, as well. Um, in these cases, Omnis are not generally not going to be preferred for that. We're mounting these access points typically up in, uh, you know, rafter type areas, uh, generally going to be 30, 40, 50 feet above, above, the, above the floor itself. And a lot of times what we're going to be doing with that is using antennas and pointing them that directional pattern directly down to the floor. Cause that's generally where our clients are gonna be. And what we're doing is we're creating a, a bunch of smaller cells uh, throughout that and making it very deterministic, which AP those clients are gonna be connected to. So that's the picture on the left. The picture on the right, you kind of see that access point up on the wall uh, hung above those, those clients that are, that are down below. We're gonna use a directional antenna to kind of tilt the coverage pattern down towards the floor where those clients are. So again, understanding the RM implications of this is important. This is not your typical uh, you know, carpeted office type environment where you can let the controller be deterministic with this. A lot of times we have to use a manual RF plan for these kind of things, just because we don't have, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, that that uh, AP to AP communication is just not as, uh, as, as um, widespread as we typically would see in a carpeted environment. And here's a quick example of sometimes when you're doing outdoor type environments, whether it be a stadium, whether it be an outdoor uh, location that you may need to light up, a courtyard, something like that. Sometimes you got to get creative with the antenna uh, and the mounting of where you're going to be. Back in episode 10, Ian did a bunch of interviews with um, a couple of our third party antenna vendors that we work, uh, work a lot with uh, on this one. I encourage everyone to go back and listen to that. There are a number. Uh, those guys get super creative with the uh, antennas, the mounting, the, the options that they have for uh, putting them into a, you know, uh, various, um, various apparatus that may be deployed throughout your, your location, whether it be an amusement park, uh, whatever it may be, um, they, they can do a lot of cool things with that. So go back and listen to episode 10 if you missed that, and uh, you can see Ian's uh, discussion with a lot of those guys. And the last one I'll mention here for kind of getting creative with this is we do have the ability with the 9130, because it is an 8x8, uh, 5 gigahertz radio, you can actually split that radio up into dual 4x4, 5 gigahertz radio. So sometimes what we may want to do is use a single radio and, and hang two different antennas off of it, off the each uh, each uh, uh, each one of the 5 gigahertz radios that we have client serving. So in this case, we would put a, in, you know, this is showing a wide patch antenna. Maybe this is covering... Uh, an area like a concourse or something underneath a stadium where we've got, uh, you know, uh, the, the the vendors that are serving the food and the drinks and that kind of thing. We may want to use more of a wider patch antenna like we talked about earlier. And then on the other side where I'm pointing back towards the seats that I'm kind of covering, maybe I want to use a narrow high gain antenna uh, for that one to send a, a, a longer distance and pick up clients that are um, further away from this access point. So you can get creative with this, too. And I can say, you know, the sky's the limit when this comes to these kind of things. So just kind of think outside the box. Um, a lot of times when we're looking at, you know, antenna design for things that you may need to do. Wait, but what about 
Wi-Fi 60 and 6 gigahertz. So a lot of what we talked about obviously has to do with 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. As Al alluded to earlier, obviously there are going to be some changes as we get into 6 gigahertz. But we've, as you've kind of walked through these sessions with us today, we know that there are uh, some challenges still out there around uh, standard power and being able to use 6 gigahertz outdoors. But I really want to get into 6 gig and I want to be able to use the 6 gigahertz space for certain venues that I may have. Well, we just introduced the 9166D uh, with this one. So this is falls in line with the current uh, uh, Wi-Fi 60 platforms that we have today, the 9162, 64, and 66. This just has a directional antenna built into it. And what that basically means, we look at kind of the antenna patterns that come off of the 9166i versus the 9166d. You can see the i is really designed with that omnidirectional antenna. So it's almost got that bubble uh, donut-like uh, antenna pattern off it, really designed for kind of indoor uh, carpeted type environments. We probably, you know, I'm sure everyone on, the, on this uh, YouTube broadcast has seen, um, has deployed these in the past. The directional now allows us to have more of that conical uh, directional kind of focus. And so it's really bolting that directional antenna directly into the access point itself. So you don't have to have an extra uh, directional antenna on it. It's already built directly into to the access point, And we're allowed to use this with the current rules that exist uh, with uh, with six gigahertz. So kind of the best of both worlds when it comes to that. And we started to look at, you know, kind of environments where we think this is going to be a perfect use case would be rooms like this, those large lecture style rooms, um, you know, cons or uh, um, locations where you may have um, conference centers, things like that, where, where I need to kind of use use directional antennas, but I really want to take advantage of all the advantage or take advantage of what six gigahertz provides. The 9166D may be a great fit for those kind of environments. So with that said, let me pass it back to Al to kind of wrap yeah. us up with some quick reminders. Great, great example, uh, Scott, of of, an, of a venue that's maybe not like you know the size of a of a convention center, but still every bit as much critical in terms of high density. So, um, so a couple of things, just touch on some things that we just highlight that we've looked at. RF design is critical, right? We have to do this. Things have to be exact. We have to have exact positions. We have to have exact locations. Um, don't forget about those infrastructure requirements. Um, and and um, again, just double click on this optimization um, and, and, and AI will not fix a bad design. So you have to have good design principles to start with. And finally, I, we kind of, Scott and I talked about this. We added this one in just sort of as a, maybe it's obvious, but if you've never worked on an HD design, find somebody who has and, and bring them into the project with you. Um, failure is a brutal teacher. Right. As we so, both know, right, at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I think, Scott, is there anything else you want to? Well, yeah, and I'll finish, finish this up. So I just want to uh, reference a couple of upcoming episodes, uh, episode 12 and 13. Uh, as, as Dan mentioned earlier, uh, feel free to go out and register. And here are the locations. I'll pass it back over to Dan to kind of wrap us up. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Al. Great info on high density wireless deployments. Love it. And uh, the announcement on the 9166D as well. Thanks for sharing that. So it looks like we're squared away on the questions here. And so as far as the, when you close out, there is a survey that pops up. Please give us feedback. We'd like to continue to improve this series as we go. And uh, like Scott had mentioned, we've got some great upcoming episodes and content. Again, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified when we go live and see all the great content we've already produced out there. That's youtube.com slash at symbol get unplugged. And you can register for upcoming episodes at cs.co slash get unplugged. And if you have any questions, like Alan mentioned there at the end, you can always reach out to your account team. They know how to get a hold of us. Or if you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can reach us now at via email at getunplugged at cisco.com. We love interacting and uh, you know talking to you. So please feel, feel free to reach out if you'd like. So that's it. That's another great episode in the books. So until next time, thank you for tuning in and stay connected and unplugged.